Hello everyone, I was just out and about hunting for a nice place to take a video, a new place. And I thought I would have found a quiet location, but I, I forgot that there's just no specific time for the traffic anymore. I, I remember even when I was younger, there used to be specific times of day where you would have the traffic. And now it's just constant. It, it never ends. You know, middle of the afternoon and there's still car after car after car after car on a back road. So I apologize if it gets a little noisier than it should be sometimes. I'm scouting for new locations to shoot video. But I thought we'd do a brief talk, maybe a walk and talk. And let's talk a little bit about witness critical thinking and my unusual um, counterintuitive or paradoxical experiment growing up. And, or experience, I should say, experiment. Yeah, you know what, we were an experiment for the governing body, but experience. Uh, if I'm not as coherent as I normally am, it's probably because I'm sleep deprived and it's my own fault. But anyway, let's get on with it. So the way I was raised is relatively early on in my life, I was introduced to being very critical of companies, brands, corporations, governments. And of course, as witness parents, uh, my mother and father did, you know, try to be politically neutral, like whatever that means. The definition varies from hall to hall, from witness to witness. <clears throat> but my mother did try to educate me and to educate herself about health, about where food came from, about the effects that it had on pharmaceuticals, on... Um, even like sitting down watching TV, she would even teach me about, um, see, this is how this commercial is manipulating you. This is how they're trying to get you to think this way or feel this way about this thing by presenting things in a certain light and everything. And I have to be thankful for that. And it, it just makes me laugh coming out of Watchtower Society. Uh, one would have thought, you know, intelligent people critical thinking people wouldn't have fallen for it or would have been trapped in it for as long as we were. And unfortunately, as much as some might think witnesses are just stupid or ignorant or uneducated and everything like that, there are educated and intelligent witnesses inside the organization. People that have never experienced the brainwashing process, indoctrination programming, you know, the bite model. They cannot have any understanding of what that's like and how it can fracture your thinking, how you have to compartmentalize and justify and all the mental gymnastics that you can come up with to justify your beliefs. But a lot of people do that. Confirmation bias... Cognitive dissonance, you know, it's a thing. And it's hardly unique to Watchtower. So, just circling back to my own experience growing up, was I was taught to question. And I have to be thankful to my parents because up until about 2013, 2012, 2013, oh, that magical time, to me, the governing body was barely a thing. I knew that it existed, but I didn't really know what it was. I couldn't have named any of them. I didn't know what it did. I didn't even necessarily know where it was. You know, maybe somewhere in New York. Wasn't sure. And that's, honestly, that's the way they should have kept it. I wonder oftentimes about their motivations. Hang on. Their, their motivations for coming out into the public, into the spotlight. Like, what were they thinking? Um, and there's all kinds of potential reasons and theories behind it, but regardless, they did it. And it was a mistake. But growing up, I was never taught that we're following the governing body, that we're following men 
and my mother once related to me an experience that she had in the ministry where uh, basically a householder said, you know, you guys are following this group of men in New York. Um, I wasn't there, so I don't know exactly what they said, but that's the gist of it. Probably like, you know, you're a cult, you're following human leadership, you, you, you don't even know this about your religion kind of stuff. And my mother was able to honestly reply that she probably couldn't even name one of the governing body members at the time because they didn't used to be this prominent. So for younger witnesses, especially that are waking up now, you might not entirely remember a time because the organization as it exists now is extremely different to what it used to be. The organization um, used to take, oh, I, I don't know how to put this, take itself more seriously. Um, I think especially, too, hiding its image was a lot easier before the internet and video streaming and sharing services became so um, integrated into our society and readily accessible to all tiers of society, from the poorest to the highest. But through the 90s and early 2000s, it was really a different organization. It, it wasn't as tyrannical. It didn't have the kind of stranglehold on its uh, slaves, good-for-nothing slaves, as I specifically would call them, that it does now. And the governing body just wasn't important to your rank-and-file witness, at least in my area. It really wasn't talked about. And then, as I mentioned before, I don't think I ever use the terms governing body, faithful and discreet slave, in any of my parts, talks, or prayers. I don't remember ever doing it. And if I did, maybe it was part of the outline or the actual material at hand. Or in a reading of the Watchtower or um, a book study, Bible study, whatever they were calling it at the time. So... You know, I was that different kind of witness, and it always bugged me. It, it just, it felt wrong whenever a brother would, you know, thank Jehovah for his faithful slave and the governing body in a prayer or something like that. It never sat right with me. And I'm just happy that my parents were able to instill in me that education, or that uh, the principle of not following men, of not just blindly trusting men, that we were here to serve Jesus, well, Jehovah, as Jesus always took a back seat in organizational matters, um, anything to do with the society and everything like that. He was kind of a, basically relegated to sidekick, I guess. Uh, if that's a good way of putting it. And it just extended into other areas of my life, and it's why it wasn't an issue for me to walk away from the organization, from the society. Because they have turned themselves, the organization, into God, into God's channel, into uh, God's organization that doesn't exist in the Bible, that word doesn't exist in the Bible, he had a people, Israel, as a material nation, taken out of the nations to bring the seed through, the Messiah, as a, a pure, edemic man, you know, pure in his gene orations. But the Christian congregation, which congregation, that's church, Uh, is his quote-unquote organization, a term that is never used in the Bible, neither is corporation. And that's all I, there another corporation. Well, people have made an idol out of this corporation. Uh, what is a corporation? In corpus, incorporated. Incorporation has its origins on earth from when the Knights Templar would raid uh, cargo ships and merchant transports. 
they had a very powerful navy. Um, people don't often associate, you know, knights at medieval times with such things, but they did. And they would steal cargoes, and they were very good at it, and they got extremely wealthy. And they had deals with the powers that be and stuff to protect them for a time. But these merchants and these kings, they were tired of losing their cargoes. So what they did was they invented the process of incorporation. So a corporation is an entity. It is a dead entity. To help you understand that, can you uh, pick up the phone right now and talk with Mr. Uh, Chase Bank of Manhattan? Can you talk with McDonald's Corporation? Can you speak with, you know, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania? No. You can speak with a representative and you can have paperwork that is signed by a signatory but you cannot talk with these entities because they are dead. They are paper fictions. They don't exist. So what they would do with vessels, with ships, was they would slap a name on it, they would incorporate it, turn it into an entity, you know, I don't know, the um, SS Bluefin or something. And then if that ship got overwhelmed, the cargo was taken, uh, it was the liability of SS Bluefin Incorporated, not of the merchant behind it. So incorporation uh, has liability protections behind it. And in reality, it's for uh, more than liability. It's honestly for sleazy business practices. It's to protect people by making persons in the form of corporations and their officers. Corporate officers. Ships and vessels have officers. Corporations have officers. So you can be a man that at times acts as a chief financial officer. But that is your person. That is a persona. That is not who you are. You are a man or a woman. But you can have this protection of officer. You can be a man who at times acts as a police officer. And you can file a suit against that uniform, that officer. Or you can press claim against the man who at times acts as an officer. And corporations are not the realm of living men and women. They are uh, soulless, dead, evil. They grind you between their cogs, just like Watchtower. Uh, that's what they do. Well, that's what a corporation is. It's for liability purposes, and so if in the event of loss, sleaze, corruption, extortion, fraud, there's extra layers of protection behind that. So a corporation can be liquidated. A corporation can be bankrupt. Um, a incorporated uh, business providing government services can be bankrupt. Can bankrupt. Sovereign entities and men and women actually can't bankrupt. They're not liable for it. Only an incorporated entity can go through the process of bankruptcy. A person, a persona, like a transmitting utility. Well, that's a subject for another another video. Uh, not on this platform either. But beware the corporations. They are not your friends. They are soulless dead entities. Be careful who you trust. Really think about who you're giving your devotion to, your service to, your time to. And I'll turn around because I don't know where this road is going. Watchtower has done nothing to earn your trust or devotion, honestly. And I think it shows that their fruits are so many people leaving in droves. You know, where is this great harvest that Revelation talks about? Do we really think that it's 8 million people? It says a great harvest. The harvest is many, but the workers are few. 
So get out of Babylon the Great, which I do still believe, um, at least it's indicated in the scripture, that Babylon the Great is religion, is a religious entity. That, to me, that's the most logical conclusion based on the verses that we have. The issue is that Watchtower separates itself and pretends to be the true religion when they are not. Uh, sorry, I had to pause. Um, neighbor just asked me what I was up to, which is understandable. There, this used to be the least violent state in the entire Union, uh, per capita by a long shot, but a large number of transplants has shifted that around, and things are weird. So, big hooded guy he's never seen before walking through his neighborhood. He was just curious, so stopped to chat with him for a little bit, and I, I understand. So, entirely consensual encounter. Uh, it's completely fine. I respect it. I do the same thing. Uh, my issue is when people decide to be Karens or Darens. I uh, don't like that. Anyways, what are we talking about? Oh yeah, Babylon the Great. So, Watchtower calls it the World Empire of False Religion. I just call it religion. And ultimately it all comes back to a certain city in Italy. Uh, whether people want to believe that's a conspiracy theory or not, the seat of Babylon moves around the world. Oh, it used to literally be Babylon. That's why Babylon is used there. Very near the cradle of post-flood civilization. Or Noah's flood, anyway. And that's why that term is used illustratively. But, yeah. So I, I consider I consider Watchtower to be uh, a part of that. Now, uh, it's like, well, how can you think that? How you are a witness, and don't they teach the... Okay, they don't know what they teach. They change their doctrines constantly. How can they have the true doctrines? Uh, it's Charles Tays Russell that came up with the illustration of when you're uh, trying to put on new gas lights and light up your house, you don't extinguish the old ones. New light isn't supposed to extinguish old light. So a complete reform, a complete 360, a complete re-edit is not an adjustment in understanding. It's taking the light and changing it from a gas light to an electric light in the apartment complex next over. It's not... It doesn't make any sense. And I invite you to... I'll put the quote and that in the description below um, of the Proverbs chapter in different Bible versions uh, so you can see the context of that verse. It has nothing to do with a changing understanding of basic truths. And as I've said before, I believe that Watchtower has some things right. Like, I, mo a lot of religions actually have some things right. If not doctrinal, then uh, principally, at least, I, I believe that. Um, that's demonstrable. But as Watchtower says... Um, as they judge all other religions, would you drink a, a cup of water if there was just a little bit of poison in it? And it's like, well, no, you don't want to do that. So why does that same standard not apply to Watchtower? It's, it's very hypocritical. Um, the standards that you use to judge, you know, you will be judged by. Um, so, in summary, in conclusion, I guess for this testimony, beware the corporations, look at the fruits that they yield, uh, look at the standards by which they judge, and just try to use your critical thinking. Thaddeus out.